Hello, this is Juan Sansini, and welcome to our program. Uh, inevitably, every semester of every year that I've been teaching publicly, there will always be a student who comes up to me and asks me, do ghosts really exist? And over the years, uh, in, in living at my home temple, I have found that there will always be occasions when uh, lay people come up to me and they say, oh, Sinim, you know, I had a dream and I think it's a, it's a past life memory. It's a memory of who I was in my past life. So uh, considering how often these topics come up, we've decided to do a special two-episode series uh, to consider the topic, Is There Life After Death? Does some part of human consciousness survive the death of our body? In today's episode, part one, we will consider the question, do ghosts really exist? And in our next episode, part two, we will consider the question, is there really such a thing as reincarnation? So, let's talk about ghosts. The other question that I always get from my students is, um, have I personally ever seen a ghost? And the answer that to, to that question is no, I've, I've never seen a ghost directly. But I do have a ghost story to tell. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, when I was uh, the most junior member of our, of our monastery among my Dharma brothers, uh, I, was, I had just received my monastic precepts, and it was in the evening, and we had just finished cleaning all the rooms of the monastery, which is a, a routine that we do on a daily basis. And I was in the, uh, the bathroom facility uh, washing the, uh, the mop rags and all the towels and kinds of things that we use for cleaning. That was my duty at the time. So I was just doing my thing, you know, washing the rags, and when suddenly one of my Dharma brothers came running in. And so he comes running in and he's all breathless. And he looks, he's in a very strange uh, state of, of excitement. On the one hand, he looked very scared. On the other hand, he looked kind of surprised and maybe filled with wonder. And so he kind of came up to me half laughing, a little bit embarrassed, and he says to me, you know, there's really such a thing as ghosts. There's really such a thing as reincarnation. And so I said to him, you know, you know, calm down. I mean, what, what's going on? And, you know, at the time, my Korean was very limited, so I wasn't even very sure of what I was hearing. But he said to me very carefully, he says, there really is such a thing as ghosts. There really is such a thing as reincarnation. I've just seen it with my own eyes. So I said to him, well, could, could you explain? So apparently, just a little while before, while I was washing the mop rags, he was in our main administrative office along with another uh, older Dharma brother of ours. And in those days, uh, the, uh, the monks uh, ran the administrative office directly themselves, doing all of the managerial work and so forth. And one of the things they also did was meet with any lay people who wanted to come in for counsel uh, with, with us monks. So it was late in the evening. There weren't many people around, and a, a small family had come in bringing in this woman. I, I can't remember how old she was. I seem to remember that she, she may have been in her 30s. And they made the claim that this woman was haunted by the ghost, they believe, of her uncle. I think it was the uncle. So, uh, you know, my friend and my older dumber brother were a little bit skeptical, but they said, okay, uh, could you please explain? And so the family explained, and, and this woman looked very kind of subdued and, and almost depressed. And she didn't say much, she just kind of let, kept looking down. And the family explained that recently, after the death of their uncle, uh, this woman had begun to behave in unusual ways, behaving uh, like the uncle. In fact, sometimes claiming that she was the uncle and speaking in an older male voice. Now, this young woman apparently did not like eating fish, but the uncle uh, was well known within the family to really enjoy eating fish. So every time, apparently, the ghost inhabited her, 
she would go into the refrigerator and start eating a lot of fish, enjoying it, and then later, when she kind of came back to who she normally was, uh, she would feel really sick and disturbed because she had eaten so much fish. So, so this was a story they told, and uh, the, uh, you know, my friend just kind of observed, not knowing what to think, and the older Dharma brother, very, you know, who was not, not thrown off by the story at all, just said to the woman, he says, well, is, is this ghost with you now? Can you, can you feel its presence? And she nodded and said, yes, he's, he's with us right now. And he says, well, can I talk to him? And she looked a little nervous. She looked at her family and they kind of, you know, urged her to go on. So she, she closed her eyes, she relaxed, and then when she opened her eyes, it was like she had suddenly become the uncle. And she started talking in the uncle's voice, speaking in a male voice. And as my friend put it, when he heard the change in her voice, when he saw the transformation in her face, he said that it just, it was almost like a, a current of electricity went through him. And, uh, you know, his mouth went dry. He couldn't say anything. He was shivering. Uh, fortunately, our older Dumber brother was able to keep his composure. And he very calmly uh, explained to this apparently possessed woman uh, that, that, the, you know, that he as the uncle had passed on, that he ought to move on, he ought not to you know, become attached to the family. And then the whole thing was uh, you know, quietly concluded and, and he advised the family to, to, you know, to do certain ceremonies to aid in the passage of the, of the spirit of the uncle. So that's, that's the story. And, and from that point on, uh, my, my friend, the Dharma brother, always believed very strongly in, uh, you know, in, in the existence of ghosts and, and in particular the existence, the reality of reincarnation. Now, now, I do know that the story sounds like a scene from a horror movie or a ghost story. And actually, there's a, there's a good reason for that because most horror movies and most ghost stories are based on uh, religious beliefs and practices and teachings. They are usually a kind of vulgarization or a distortion of actual uh, teachings that have been passed down through the centuries. The fact is, in this modern day and age, uh, we don't you know, often talk about it, but the truth is that all, probably all religious traditions in the world posit the existence of ghosts. Now, in the case of Korean Sun Buddhism, uh, there is a belief that ghosts exist, but they are not treated. They are not viewed as something threatening. They are not, they are not uh, viewed as something demonic or evil. The Buddhist view of the universe is that human beings share this world with a wide variety of intelligent beings, such as deities, certain kinds of supernatural beings, uh, beings who live in, you know, in hell realms, in heavenly realms, and these also include ghosts. And from the Buddhist perspective, we're all just neighbors living together in the same world, and we're called upon to treat each other with respect and courtesy. So when you see in, in certain forms of Korean Buddhism what appear to be rituals uh, that are you know, addressed to deities and other supernatural beings, it's not really an act of worship. It's just showing in a ceremonial way uh, due respect. Basically, it's just people trying to uh, mind their manners and be courteous and have good manners. So this, this also applies to ghosts. Any Buddhist ceremony that's designed uh, to deal with ghosts, they're not aggressive. They're not designed to expel the ghosts and send them to hell or something like that. They are teachings and practices that are meant to help these so-called ghosts. Basically, they are uh, an expression of friendly advice and loving support. Ghosts, in the end, according to the tradition, are basically people. As my teacher, Sun Master Songdam, likes to say, people are ghosts with bodies, and ghosts are people without bodies. So why don't we take a moment now to meditate, and why don't we listen to Sun Master Songdam as he teaches us in his Dharma speech how to approach the existence of wandering spirits. Samge you will see me. 
개성은 팔만 대장경 가운데에도 최고의 높고 깊고 넓은 진리를 설하신 화암경에 있는 개성입니다. 삼계의 유일심이요. 심의 무별법이다. 욕계, 색계, 무색계에 대한 말씀이 있었는데 그 삼계 오직 한 마음이다. 마음 밖에는 다른 법이 없느니라. 삼계 가운데에는 제일 높은 비비상천으로부터 제일 무섭고 고약한 데가 지옥인데 지옥부터서 비비상천까지 한마디로 말하면 삼계입니다. 그 삼계는 오직 한 마음이다 이것입니다. 그 마음밖에는 딴 것이 없다. 전체가 오직 마음으로 이루어졌다 이것입니다. 마음이 없다면 천당도 없고 지옥도 없는 것이 마음이 있기 때문에 천당도 있고 지옥도 있다. 그런데 신불급중생이 시산부차별이다. 그 마음과 그 마음을 깨달은 부처님과 마음을 가지고 있으면서도 깨닫지 못한 모든 중생이 이세 가지가 축 조금도 차별이 없다 그러셨습니다. 왜 중생과 부처님이 확실히 차이가 있을 텐데 왜 없다고 하느냐. 깨닫지 못한 분사에는 부처님 다르고 중생 다르고 마음 다르고 그랬지만 수행을 해서 참나를 깨닫고 보면 확실히 그세 가지가 차별이 없다고 하는 것을 깨닫게 되는 것입니다. 부처님 말씀 가운데 일수사견이라 한 말씀이 있는데 한 물에 네 가지 견해가 있다. 물을 보고서 사람들은 그걸 물이라 그러고 저 천상 사람들이 물을 보고는 그것을 유리라 그러고 그리고 고기는 그 물을 보고 자기 집이라 그래. 또 지옥 중생들은 물을 보고 불이라 그래. 물만 목이 말라서 물을 마시면 목에서 불이 펄펄 나니까 지옥 중생은 불이라 그래. 어째서 같은 물을 보고 각기 다른 견해를 갖느냐. 그와 마찬가지. 부처님과 중생과 마음이 촉 꿈도 차별이 없지만 자기의 업 때문에 다 달리 보나 불이라고 보나 유리라고 보나 집이라고 보나 이름은 다르지만 그 자체는 변함이 없어. 
그래서 우리가 지은 업에 따라서 각기 다른 소견을 갖지만 은 전부가 한 마음으로 온 세계가 마음으로 이루어졌으니 그 마음을 닦지 못하면 자기의 업에 따라서 육도윤회를 하는 것이고 정법을 믿고 그 마음을 깨달으면 우리가 모두가 다 부처님이 되는 것입니다. 지금 이 용화사 법보선은 법보전에 8만 6 9 2 5번까지 말린 우페 번호가 나가 있고 거기에 모셔진 영가수는 14만 13만 4,342위의 영가가 모셔져 있습니다. 이 영가 가운데에는 늙어서 돌아가신 분 젊어서 돌아가신 분, 어려서 죽은 사람, 태중에서 죽은 영가도 있습니다. 하늘에서 떨어져서 돌아가신 분, 각종 사고로 돌아가신 분, 전쟁하다가 전사하신 분, 교통사고로 돌아가신 분, 자살하신 분, 고문받다가 형무소에서 돌아가신 분, 불이 나서 화재로 돌아가신 분, 물에 빠져 돌아가신 분, 비명 액사하신 분, 혼비 백산하신 분, 편안히 누워서 돌아가신 분, 그 이로 돌아가신 형태도 가지각색입니다. 주인이 입고 없는 그 많은 영가를 여기에 모셨는데 만약에 여기에 모시지 않았다면 우주 공간 산천 초목에 붙어서 험해고 의지할 데가 없는 것입니다. 아함경에 팔뚝만한 나무에도 다, 다 귀신이 붙어 있다고 하셨습니다. 왜 거기에 붙어 있냐 하면은 의지할 데가 없기 때문에 거기에 붙어서 사는 것입니다. 우리의 선망 부모, 우리의 원근 친척 가족도 의지할 띠가 없어서 무주 고혼이 되어 가지고 우주 법계를 험해고 다닐 것입니다. 다행히 이 법보단에 다 모셔 모시고 어, 정월이나 4월 초파일, 8월 추석, 동지보다 이런 입춘 이런 명절에 반드시 지혜사를 올리고 천도 법요식을 거행합니다. So as we've just heard in Sun Master Songdam's Dharma speech, ghosts are people too, and just as we care for our family and our friends and our loved ones, we're also called upon to do what we can to take care of them. Now I remember when I first heard him say that even the smallest tree has all of these ghosts attached to it. He also says that uh, even the, the smallest piece of land, even the, a piece of land the size of, of your palm, has all of these ghosts attached to it. When I, when I first heard that, uh, I, you know, I was uh, kind of scared of going to the bathroom by myself for a while. But um, all of that aside, um, from a scientific point of view, is there, is there any kind of investigation or research or data that can tell us whether ghosts really do or do not exist. Now, mainstream scientists have not historically studied uh, the question of the existence of so-called ghosts, but there is a field of science called parapsychology that is devoted to investigating claims and events that mainstream scientific theories cannot explain. And these so-called parapsychologists, for nearly the last century and a half, have been researching and investigating uh, unusual so-called paranormal events like ghost sightings. Uh, in 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was established in London, and it was a group of scientists, philosophers, scholars, people in prominent positions in society who had questions about the existence 
of, uh, you know, about the nature of human existence and, and, and about the nature of the universe that surrounds us. And since the establishment of these organizations and others like it many, many years ago, there has been actually a great deal of investigation done by parapsychologists and an enormous amount of data has been compiled uh, about so-called so ghosts. And when we go through this data, what we will find is that in some respects, uh, so-called ghost sightings are similar to what we see in the movies and, and we, what we read about in ghost stories and so forth, but in many respects they are not. So why don't we go through this information together? First of all, no one uses the word ghost anymore. At least no, no parapsychologist uses the word ghost. It is now called an apparitional event or an apparitional experience. And this refers to someone um, seeing or feeling the presence of another human being or a living being or even an inanimate object when there is no uh, physical mechanism or physical process that can explain why this person saw what they saw. Okay, So these are technically called apparitional events. The next thing that we need to understand is that in all cultures, in all societies, in all civilizations, throughout the world and throughout history, there have always been people who openly claim, who publicly claim, that they have had some form of encounter with a deceased person. And what's interesting when you look at the data is that these kind of claims exist all the way up to the modern day. So, for example, in 1979, parapsychologist John Palmer uh, surveyed 622 residents of Charlottesville, Virginia, in the United States, asking them whether they have ever experienced some form of contact with what they believe to be a ghost. 17% of the people he surveyed said that they had experienced an encounter with what they believed to be a ghost. Three quarters of that 17% said that they had had that experience more than once. Another example, in 1975, Erlander Haraldsson surveyed uh, people in Iceland. And one of the questions he asked was, have you ever perceived or sensed the nearness of a deceased person? 31% replied that they had. Now what's interesting about these claims that people make is that they don't always say that they saw something. The, the term ghost sighting is actually inaccurate. In many cases, uh, the subjects who, who claim to have had such an experience say that they simply sense the nearness, the presence of what they believe to be a deceased person, or they may have even heard the voice or heard something. So for example, in John Palmer's uh, survey of the residents of Charlottesville, Virginia, he found that only 44% of the people he, who claimed to have had an encounter with a ghost actually saw something. The rest of the people only uh, sensed or heard or otherwise uh, had a different kind of experience than a visual one. Now what's interesting in these kinds of apparitional events is that uh, unlike what you see in horror movies and read about in ghost stories, most of these encounters occurring right in the middle of the day, in broad daylight. Another interesting thing is that when they do have a visual experience of an apparition, uh, the so-called ghost appears completely solid and real. They're not, they're not like floating in the air and, you know, half transparent. They look so solid and real, in fact, that the subject often believes that the person is actually there. But, as in a lot of ghost stories, eventually uh, these, uh, these apparitions simply vanish right in front of their eyes. And in those rare cases when the subject actually tries to touch the apparition, just like in the movies, their hand seems to pass through. Uh, another interesting thing is that these, uh, these apparitions, these ghosts, often don't really seem to perceive the existence of the person who is witnessing them. They seem to be behaving and acting in a, in, in a reality of their own and don't seem aware of their physical surroundings. Nonetheless, not only do human beings uh, witness such apparitions, but it's been well recorded that animals also react to them too. Now these apparitions are almost always of people that the subject 
or the witnesses know. Very rarely do people see strangers. Another interesting thing is that unlike, um, unlike the movies, when people actually see ghosts, they don't get scared. It's, it's kind of unusual or, or unexpected, but they actually feel very, very calm. And what they really feel in most cases is just a sense of curiosity, you know, a sense of wonderment. Another interesting thing is that uh, when people do you know, uh, see or experience an apparition, usually they're in a very, very calm state, a very restful state. There's a lot of cases where they just come out of a, you know, out of a nap or they had been dozing off, they raise their head and suddenly they see something that they've never seen before. They are in a state, you might say, of meditation. Uh, now, the, the most interesting cases of apparitional events are when a lot of people uh, see the same thing, and this is called collective perception of an appar apparition. So I'd like to uh, share an example, a very famous one, uh, of a case in which parapsychologists went to study, went to investigate a case where many people had seen the same apparition. And this is a very famous case in its time. It's, it's often referred to as the Cheltenham case. Cheltenham is a, is a uh, place in England. There is a large uh, stone house. It's still standing today, as I, as I understand it, in Cheltenham. And in 1882, a 19-year-old medical student was living in the Cheltenham house with her family when she saw what she thought to be a ghost. She, uh, she was in her bedroom in the middle of the night and she heard uh, a sound of something brushing past her door. So uh, she was curious, she picked up a candle, it was the middle of the night, which of course is unusual for a ghost sighting, but anyhow, she opened the door, she walked out, and she saw what she called a tall dark lady standing at the head of the stairs. And the tall dark lady started to go down the stairs and this young medical student, her name was Rosina Despard, Rosina started to follow, but her candle went out, and so she decided to go back to her bedroom. This was in 1882, and for two years afterward, this tall, dark lady kept appearing over and over and over again. Rosina described her in later years as appearing to be a kind of widow in mourning. In most cases, um, what would happen is that uh, Rosina, in the middle of the night, would hear something outside of her door, the t what she felt to be the tall, dark lady walking by. She would go out into the hallway, follow the tall, dark lady, down the stairs, and into the drawing room. And the tall, dark lady would go stand by a window for a while, and then she would head out, uh, as if to go out the garden door and then just vanish. As time passed, other members of the family, other members of the household also began to see and witness this tall, dark lady. Rosina's older sister saw it, uh, the housemaid saw it, and her younger brother, who was just an eight or nine year old child, also saw it. And this went on for a long time, and the family tried to keep it a secret. The father was concerned that if their house became associated with, uh, you know, a haunting, that the, uh, the value of the property would go down. Rosina herself was afraid that if, if she was associated with some kind of weird ghost story, that this would threaten her medical career. So during the time that most of these events were occurring, the family tried to keep it a secret. In later years, Rosina Despard wrote a book, published a book that, that, uh, that tells of her experiences, but she published it under a pseudonym, the pseudonym of Miss R.C. Morton. Now, the, uh, the activity of this tall, dark lady came to a peak in the summer of 1884. More than 20 people are recorded as having witnessed this tall, dark lady. These include members of the family, friends, visitors, servants, and, and you know, maids working in the house. It's even been recorded that two dogs reacted in terror, were able to perceive the, uh, the presence of this tall, dark lady. In 1885, the Society for Psychical Research heard about the case and decided to investigate it. And the president at the time, Frederick Myers himself, came out to the house and began to undertake a study. He tried to take a photograph of, of, of the tall, dark lady, but the problem was that this is the late 19th century, 
And in order to take a photo with a camera in those days, the subject has to stay still for quite a long time because of the long exposure time of the cameras that were used in those days. So the tall, dark lady would just move away before, um, you know, before they could take a photo. So what they tried to do instead was they tied a string across the hallway to block its progress. But of course, the tall, dark lady simply passed right through the string as if she were insubstantial. Rosina herself many times tried to touch the ghost, uh, the so-called ghost, but the tall, dark lady would just move away and avoid being touched. Uh, when Rosina tried to speak with it, it seemed like the tall, dark lady was unable to speak. So everyone did a lot of research, and, and, and the question was considered, who could this tall, dark lady be? And when they researched the history of the occupants, the previous occupants of that house, uh, they learned about a person named Imogen Swinho, who, along with her husband, were the very first occupants of that house in 1860. Unfortunately, Imogen and her husband seemed to have had a very unhappy marriage. They quarreled quite often. And uh, eventually, uh, several months before the husband died, Imogen left him uh, in 1876. She moved to Bristol. And two years later, in September 1878, she died at the age of 41. So what the Society for Psychical Research did was they investigated every possible thing that they could. They interviewed everyone who had ever uh, seen the tall, dark lady. They also uh, contemplated as many alternative theories as they could. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to think of a more plausible explanation than, that, than a ghost. So they thought maybe there's a woman who was hiding in the house. So they looked all around the house. They looked for secret passageways, secret rooms, hidden cellars, hidden attics. They couldn't find anything, any presence of someone that might be hiding there or being taken care of by the family. Um, they, and uh, so they, they did all this. And this is a very representative, this method. And this whole case itself is very representative of what parapsychologists do when they investigate an apparitional event. Because uh, what be, the parapsychologists know that they are not accepted by mainstream scientists. So they want to make sure that they're not being tricked by a con artist or they're not making some kind of mistake. They want to avoid at all costs being the object of ridicule and bringing shame in, onto their field of profession. So actually, the parapsychologists are usually the most skeptical. And especially in the case of so-called ghost sightings or apparitional events, most parapsychologists, or many of them at least, don't even believe in the survival of consciousness after death. But Buddhists, of course, do believe in the survival of consciousness after death, and Buddhists do believe in the possibility of wandering spirits. So why don't we enter into meditation once again and listen to Sun Master Songdam as he tells us, as he teaches us, uh, how we should respond to the possibility of our loved ones becoming wandering spirits, our loved ones moving on to the next stage after their death in the survival of their consciousness. Why 우리 용화사 법보전 안에는 우리 집안의 영가를 소중하게 이때 보호관을 하게 됨으로써 항상 축원할 때그 영가가 무량급 업장이 소멸이 되어서 부설촌 내원궁이나 극락세계에 왕생하시기를 축원을 해 올립니다. 모든 법회 때마다 그 영가들을 위해서 공양을 하고 법문을 들려드리고 또 축원을 해 드립니다. 어떠한 누구의 제사를 봉안을 한다 하더라도 법보전 안에 있는 모든 영가분들도 그 함께 전도를 받게 되고 법문을 듣게 됩니다. 이러니 아무리 과거에 큰 죄업이 있다 하더라도 그렇게 법문을 듣고 축원을 받고 
또 공양을 받고 하면 업장이 소멸될 수밖에 없는 것입니다. 더군다나 살아서도 자기 부모님이나 또는 자기 자신을 위해서 생축으로 올려놓으면 나중에 돌아가셨다고 기별만 하면 자동으로 말년 위패에 모시게 된 제도도 있습니다. When we look at the data compiled by parapsychologists over the years and decades, we find that in, um, in apparitional events where deceased people seem to be witness, it's inevitably uh, deceased people who have had tragic or unexpected deaths, people who have uh, a lingering attachment uh, to this world, to the lives that they once had. In this sense, uh, these cases very, uh, very much resemble what we see in, in movies and read about in so-called ghost stories. And so Sun Master Song Dam tells us that it's our responsibility to respond to these, uh, to these spirits, these people, uh, with the utmost compassion and care. But what do scientists think of cases like the Cheltenham ghost? There are three basic responses, three uh, basic theories uh, that are used to try to explain um, occurrences like the Cheltenham ghost. And the first is uh, 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 basically a posture of skepticism, that, that it's, it's not a ghost. Uh, the data is either false or misinterpreted. Uh, in many cases, uh, there's an accusation that, that, the, that the subject and the witnesses who had the ap apparitional experience are, are kind of con artists. They're trying to trick people and, um, and you know, the, the, the data is in, entirely false. And in a case like the Cheltenham ghost, this is hard to believe because uh, so many people were involved and it took place over the course of several years. And nobody really profited from it. So what could possibly motivate uh, a group of people to hold up a ruse for such a long time uh, without any kind of obvious uh, you know, gain from it? The second, uh, the second idea within the skeptical theory is that it, there's a different, more plausible explanation, like it's a hallucination. People thought they saw something, but it really wasn't there. Or people thought they saw something, but it was really something else. And again, in the case of something like the uh, Cheltenham ghost, this is hard to believe because what you're asking for is for many, many people to have seen exactly the same hallucination or have made the exact same visual mistake over the course of years in a variety of different circumstances. One way or the other, however, uh, most mainstream scientists view uh, cases like the Cheltenham ghost with this kind of skepticism and insist upon a different explanation than something, uh, you know, paranormal going on. Now, the second theory is very interesting, and this is a parapsychological theory. As I've mentioned, not all parapsychologists believe in the survival of consciousness after death, but they do believe uh, in the existence of extraordinary abilities in human beings. So they explain apparitional events as being uh, the unexpected expression of a hidden extraordinary human ability, uh, usually clairvoyance, which means being able to perceive or receive information uh, from distant locations, or precognition, which means being able to perceive or receive information from uh, either the future or the past. So these people haven't seen a ghost so much as uh, they've accidentally used a, a, a what to that point was a hidden underlying power to see something from a distant location or something from another point in time. And again, the problem uh, in the case of the Cheltenham ghost is that it's hard to believe that so many people during the span of those years all had a sudden you know, activation of some kind of hidden psychic power. This explanation is actually hard to accept. Now, the third theory is that the apparition is, in fact, somehow the manifestation of a disembodied 
consciousness. And there have been many, many theories over the years uh, as to explain how this could be possible. I'll name one of the most popular ones, and that is the, this idea, and, th and this idea goes back in, into you know, ancient religious teachings, but it's the idea that human beings have basically more than one body. We have this physical body, but we also have an insubstantial, perhaps energetic body that's called by different names. One of the most popu popular uh, uh, names for this body is the so-called astral body. So our, our consciousness, in a sense, has another body that survives physical death and can manifest in our world and perhaps move on into a different body. Uh, but this is not the only uh, version of this theory. Another is that our consciousness after death may leave a kind of imprint or a reflection of itself in the physical space-time continuum. And what we're seeing when we see an apparition is a kind of echo of a consciousness that once uh, was alive in this world. And in this case, when it's an imprint of a consciousness, it's not actually an intelligent living consciousness, but once again, simply a reflection. So, how could any of this be possible? You know, can consciousness survive outside of the body? Well, that's exactly the question that we are going to take up in our next episode, part two of our special two-part series, when we consider the question, does reincarnation really occur? So I think the time is up now, and uh, we've come to the end of another episode. So I will conclude once again with a traditional greeting. May we all attain enlightenment.